Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk ETC. I have uh, Anthony with me today, and he's going to give us the latest ETC news updates. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of drama lately, so I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So welcome, Anthony Pisco. Hey, Christian. Thanks for having me. So what do you have for us today? Uh, you know, a couple things. Obviously, there's been some drama and flux in the community. Uh, ETC dev dropped off and others are now picking up at where they left off. Uh, I think in general, though, glossing over the drama, which most people are probably familiar with, it really shows the resiliency of our chain in that, uh, yeah, we lost ETC dev, but we still kept a lot of the developers that were working for them. And then on top of that, we have other developers, uh, such as Meredith Patterson's team, and others who are now looking to fill in those gaps and work on ETC as well. So I think it's really great to see that, you know, um, there's no one failure uh, of the ETC ecosystem that could bring it down. And that's uh, something that quite a lot of blockchains out there are literally run by exactly one team. And they don't have that same type of resiliency if uh, they ever fail. And I'm, talking about things like Satoshi's vision and the other one, ABC. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, I think I would have to agree with you. So ETC is, is a big proponent of decentralization. And yeah, there's no one person or team that could that can bring ETC down. That's the power, uh, an attraction of it. And yes, I think the most important thing to, to deliver today to our listeners is that uh, ETC emerged, uh, you know, s s just as good, if not stronger from this, the, the, all the, most of the developers got hired. They still have funding. Uh, you may have heard some drama. Some people may have heard about the GitHub, but it was just quickly moved to another repository. Right. And then life goes on. And, and so there really wasn't any, any lingering damage to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's still some concerns, especially with the GitHub takeover, but I'm sure the community is going to show that this is the, this type of thing and isn't tolerated at all within ETC or any other cryptocurrency community. So long term, I don't see that particular event as having a big impact on ETC, but it is very good to see everybody rally and say, no, this isn't okay. And uh, we're going to be more careful going forward because it's absolutely just wrong and not, 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 not a correct way to approach things. Right. And then one positive, one minor little thing that I kind of liked was I didn't, I never liked the old GitHub uh, address because I think it was a github.com slash Ethereum project or something like that. But I like it that everything got moved to github.com slash Ethereum classic. Uh, yes. That seems the natural, natural choice. So it was kind of a positive that came out of this, the diamond in the rough. So anyway, and then yes. Oh, that's huge news, by the way, Meredith Patterson, uh, doing contributing right if for the people that were at the very first etc summit she's a she's a a noted uh language security expert and so having her uh show some interest and, and being willing to contribute to etc i think is 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 huge or can be huge yeah absolutely and it's not just her it's her whole team right uh, they have quite a lot of very talented uh very security focused uh you know engineers and on top of that i think we're going to see soon they're probably going to have a roadmap to propose and uh it's going to be really cool so i know from what i gather and i haven't talked to meredith but she saw the drama that was happening and she she asked hey what's going on with etc and i don't know if that put the idea in her head to contribute but would it be accurate to say that because of this whole drama, we actually got more developers now at the end of it, not less. <laughs> I think that's where we're going to net out uh, three to six months from now. Is where okay. We have more developers, not less. We have more developers and we have a better uh, Git Rehub, Git, GitHub Rehub 
re, uh, repo name. So I'm happy with, yeah, on all around. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. yeah, I wasn't a fan of being named Ethereum project either on the GitHub. So <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we're just named Ethereum. Plastic. Yeah, we should have more drama like this if it always ends so well. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm good with my <laughs> little drama. All right. Later. All right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what uh, what other news do you have for us? Uh, the project Gorley is moving along really nicely, and that's basically ETC is going to get a nice test net that we're going to call uh, Kati, which is a city in Germany. And it's a POA test net, so when you're developing dApps, you have a fairly easy, simple way to deploy them and try them out. Okay. And yeah, really looking forward to that. Now, there's been, there's other test nets. Is this one somehow distinctive in some way compared to, like, what's the Calypso, I think, or the one I've heard of? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, Callisto, I don't Callisto. know. I don't, keep, I don't keep up with Callisto. Um, okay. Not a fan. Okay. But this is this is uh, an, yet another choice for developers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a POA testnet. So Can you elaborate on what that means? Yeah, if anybody's used the ring fee testnet on Ethereum, it's kind of like that. It, there's uh, some centralized servers that basically run it rather than it being a proof of work testnet like the main net. And so what that gives you when you're trying to just test out applications is it gives you a really uh, fast and responsive environment and much easier to use where you can deploy your smart contracts and not have to worry about things like mining your own blocks or uh, mining for some test DTC and that type of thing. Okay. And it just skips a lot of the headaches for dApp developers. Obviously, we're still going to keep our proof of work test net because whenever we want to make uh, some sort of change, whether it be a just a small change or a hard fork, uh, which we obviously want to minimize, but we have you know we have a hard fork coming up for to add some opcodes. Yeah. Um, in those cases, we would still be using uh, the POW testnet because it most closely mirrors what the ETC mainnet is like. Okay. And, now, oh, yeah. go ahead. What, what, what can you say, elaborate on what POA stands for? Uh, proof of authority. Okay. And, and what is, is that, that's just a fancy name for simulating proof of work without doing all the overhead? Yeah, you just have a different consensus mechanism. So rather than it being whoever mines a block gets to decide what transactions are included, uh, instead it's whatever nodes are in control of the POA network gets to decide what transactions are included. Okay. 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 So it's, uh, yeah, gotcha. So it's a different consensus mechanism that, that's better for testing in some cases. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of like ripple only it's just, we're testing for fake with fake money. And when we want to do real money, we use proof of work like it's supposed to be. Right. Okay. Yeah. Ripple being the federated network where some people have special privileges. And so proof of authority, just in the name, you can see that some people have special privileges. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. But on, on a test net, if somebody senses your transactions, it's not a big thing. Uh, you just use a different test net and you don't, you're not losing any money or any other important things. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, maybe I'll, I can put a link if, uh, to the in the metadata, is there a link to this test network that people should know about? Um, there isn't yet. Uh, there's there's a link to the Gorley project in general where they're implementing that their protocol uh, from Geth called Click in every, uh -huh. every client. But uh, no, there's there's occasionally updates though. So if you want to learn more, you could either join the Gitter. Uh, just type in Gorley Gitter into Google, G-O-E-R-R-L-I, or the, the link below this podcast, I guess. Uh -huh. And also, you could always follow uh, Afri Shodin on Twitter, and he's he tweets about it whenever there's a big update. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. What else? What else? Uh, okay. So we're planning the ETC Summit. We're just 
starting early on it. We haven't figured out where we're going to do it yet, but right now we're thinking definitely North America and maybe Vancouver or Toronto, uh, maybe a different city. But yeah, it's going well. We're obviously planning for a higher attendance rate and we're looking at maybe doing it at a university. So we get a, a bit nicer seating than we had last time. Uh, wasn't a fan of the, actually, whatever, it's not important for the podcast. <laughs> and yeah, so we're, we're moving forward on that and really looking forward to it. Going to start lining up speakers and yeah. All right. And, and so do you, any tentative uh, dates for that? Or is that still in the planning stages too? It's going to be end of September, 2019. Okay. So we'll just, we don't have exact dates yet, but it'll be end of September. I see. All right. Looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then, uh, oh, Peace Bridge has moved along since we last talked, I think. Now they have their first kind of test version ready. And uh, it's getting a lot more polished. They're working on a UI, so it's easy to use. And that's looking really, really cool. And that is to allow people to pay for things on ETC on other blockchains and vice versa? Is, is uh, that... Yep. Okay, so cross-chain uh, communications. Yeah. Okay, good. And yeah, so uh, I'm going to promote myself. Uh, early February, I think it's 8 th 9 through the 10 in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to be going to TabConf. It's a really nice, very uh, grassrootsy blockchain conference. And there, uh, both me and Yaz are going to be running a booth talking about ETC and immutability and blockchain fundamentals in general. And I'm also going to be giving a presentation there. Uh, not sure which day, which day yet, but it's going to be essentially on the case for altcoins, uh, the case for coins besides Bitcoin, and more specifically, the case for Bitcoin would do better if it was surrounded by other coins that shared its fundamentals uh, than if it was surrounded by coins that don't at all. So you want to kind of look for coins that share similar fundamentals to Bitcoin, and the more of those you could get around Bitcoin, the more likely this whole grand experiment uh, in cryptocurrencies is to take off and to take root as the thing it was meant to be and not as, a, you know, a corporate captured thing that it's not meant to be. Okay. So that, that's, that would be yet another level of decentralization, right? Talk, we were started the, the show by talking about not wanting to have a single point of failure, right? Having... Mm -hmm. Other coins besides Bitcoin is yet a more more de decentralization or dis distributed power. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So for so anybody that's in the Atlanta area, uh, if, if they're in the around, they can stop by, meet you in person, and yeah, it's great. Yeah. And yeah. the name of that conference? Can you spell it? Is a tab conf? Can you, I didn't know if I got that correct. Yeah. T a b c o n. Okay. Okay, yeah, TAP conference. Gotcha, gotcha. In Atlanta in February. Okay. Yeah, in Atlanta. You good? Should be fun. First time visiting Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, um, you want to go to the Coke factory. That's really fun. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe if I have time. <laughs> but yeah, and really to just give a brief summary, like what that presentation is going to be on is right now when somebody new comes to cryptocurrency, uh, they're going, they can look at the space and, you know, some people are going to look at Bitcoin and say, Bitcoin seems great, which it is. And Bitcoin's where I want to focus my efforts. But what we're also going to have is we're going to have people come in and they're going to say, well, I don't want to just do payments. I want to do other things. I want to do secure pay. I want to do secure payments where, or private transactions where others very likely can't see what I'm doing. I want to do smart contracts where 
I can enter into agreements with third parties and we only need to uh, write our code and then not trust each other much further. Um, and, you know, quite a lot of other other ways that people want to interact and use cryptocurrencies. And yeah, you have Bitcoin and you have a federated lightning network. Um, somewhat federated. It's, it's not really federated. It's uh, you have a distributed lightning network mm -hmm. uh, with with federated routes in between. And yeah, so they may look at that and they may say, okay, well, that's fine for me, but some people are going to want more decentralization and other people are simply going to selfishly say, I missed the boat on Bitcoin, I want other stuff. And then they're going to go and buy XRP. And when they do that, you know, they are now exposed, they've now chosen to join a community based solely on price and uh, complete lack of fundamentals. And when those when they're in that community, they're going to start to learn to disregard uh, blockchain's importance and fundamentals. They're going to be looking at things like Ripple and saying these are the good things because these have better throughput and these uh, have very low transaction costs and all these very basic things. And they're going to completely miss the lesson on what cryptocurrencies are supposed to be and why they're important and why they are structured the way that they are. I mean, this is a, these are concepts that take a good year or two, at least, if not more to really solidify in, in your mind and, and wrap your head around them. And I think Bitcoin in general uh, right now has been doing a disservice to itself when every cryptocurrency that's not Bitcoin gets kind of lumped into the same bucket uh and it's going to end up in places where you have masses of people come in and they're unable and they're not educated on the bitcoin side of the debate and they only learn of the other side that has much fancier marketing materials and uh you know just more astroturfing right <laughs> and so and, you want people yeah, bitcoin, to, to Go ahead, Kyle. Sorry. So, no. if I understand you correctly, you want people to to not just be attracted to to uh, the investment side, the price swings, but the fundamentals and the vision, the values, the principles uh, of decentralization. Yeah, so, absolutely. And you're okay. not going to get that if you end up following a Tron or an EOS type of cryptocurrency. You're not gonna. Nobody in those communities is going to explain why cryptocurrencies are important or why some of these fundamentals are absolutely necessary and if we lose them we lose all of all of what crypto gives us right right this reminds me of so there was a in the in the open source world uh, and and uh, actually he, he referred to it as free software but his name was richard stallman uh and uh, he was he would kind of have similar concerns that people would use open source and be attracted to the fact that it's free, but they wouldn't know the, the, the values and principles behind, you know, open, having software be open and, and having all that freedom. So it's kind of the same thing. You want people to think about the values and the principles behind it. Uh, actually, that's a really good point. I'm going to try and work that into my talk now. Oh, OK. That. Glad I could help. <laughs> um, yeah, it, no, it's exactly like like open source software. So you have open source software and then you have software that's just given to you for free. Um, and in both cases for a regular user, you know, you just install the software and, oh, it's free and I, now I can run it. I can run Mozilla Firefox and that's great. Um, at, or I could run Discord, for example, and that, that's fine. And one of those, Discord is free, but Firefox is open source. Uh, both for any regular user, give them the same thing. But where the difference lies that I think you were getting at is when it comes to the free thing, Discord, no part of Discord is ever going to teach me about the importance to, of open source. But if I download Mozilla Firefox, there is a, a much better chance that I'm going to learn something about why this thing exists and why open source is so important. And same thing with say Bitcoin and EOS, you know, oh, I, I go join, 
I, in both cases, I get some sort of valuable thing that I can move back and forth up around, up and down. And on EOS, I'm never going to learn anything about uh, the core fundamentals of blockchain. On Bitcoin, it's going to be actively shoved down my throat. Uh, uh-huh. So, yeah, there's there's definitely importances there. And I kind of like to compare and contrast it with uh, nations, uh, you know, countries, um, where, for example, if you're a country and you're bordered just by relatively friendly countries, even if they're indifferent to you, uh, even if they have a different currency and different economics and different beliefs, but they don't fight with you or actively argue against you, then you're going to end up a lot stronger than if you're thrust in the middle of a ton of countries that are openly hostile to you. And when you look at Bitcoin right now, what's happening is uh, a good deal of the cryptocurrencies that are openly hostile towards Bitcoin are the ones that are doing pretty well in moving in on Bitcoin's territory. And that's not good long-term for Bitcoin, no matter how uh, strong your interest in minority is. Um, it's only as strong as the nation that surrounds it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so the US, for example, we have Mexico to the south and Canada to the north, and neither of those countries are very combative with us. I mean, Mexico financially couldn't be, and Canada just has generally good agreements right. with us. And, you know, that's something that's grown over centuries, and there's, it's, very likely led to, uh, you know, the U.S.'s isolation there and being separated by large physical borders, you know, uh, with the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean also give it that strength where things can't easily encroach on it. Uh, Whereas if you look at a country where they have, you know, you're bordered by six or seven other countries and some of them are actively hostile to you, that doesn't bode well for for your endurance uh in this israel yeah israel Israel. for example right right so yeah it's good to have strength in numbers have friendly countries around you can share the 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 load the 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 defense security yeah exactly yeah now let me try to help you a little bit more with your talk so I can tell you the other side and the, the, the debate Stallman would have. So some people in, in the open source community would say that we, we some people would say, no, we, sh- we shouldn't talk about the principles because corporate, we want to attract corporations and they don't care about that. We should just emphasize the software's free and have really nice marketing materials so that we could gather as many of those people as possible to grow the community. And Stallman would say, well, if we have a big community, what does it matter if we've, you know, sacrificed, you know, sold our soul? Um, anyways, I could imagine people, like you said, uh, Ripple and some of those other blockchains have fancy marketing. I, I would maybe I could see some people say that, well, that's important because that attracts certain people that don't care about the principles. And mm-hmm. uh, anyway, so just something to think about. Yeah, people say it attracts people that don't care about the principles. But caring about the principles in the first place takes effort. It takes time. Uh, You know, if you want to attract more people to Bitcoin, let them go somewhere else first that has the same principles and you don't have to deal with it until they have properly learned why all of this, these things are important. No, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so try to, the, the goal, of course, is try to have it both, right? Have the fancy marketing materials, attract the people, that care about principles and decentralization, but also, you know, have the principles underneath for the people that do care about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, good. Any, any other thoughts or any other news? Um, those are the majority of my thoughts for this week. Uh, there's just so much going on. It's hard to remember everything. Um, one other thing that I've, become very passionate about in the past few months is uh, ETC's gas limit is way too high. Okay. Uh, This is kind of similar to a Bitcoin block size debate 
Um, but if we look at the Ethereum side, you know, it takes four to five days uh, to fully sync a node now, and that's after a year of Ethereum running, which is really unacceptable in my view, because that means that in four years, you know, if somebody wants to sync their own node, it's going to take a month. <laughs> that's a highly centralizing thing. And because people are just not, are going to be much less likely to do it. And when they're less likely to do it, that means fewer and fewer nodes actually control the information you get out of the network and fewer and fewer people have the full picture on the state of the network. And so what I'm going to be proposing uh, in an ECIP, maybe next week, maybe the following week, because uh, we got Chris we have Christmas coming up, is that ETC needs to reduce its gas limit and probably ideally somewhere around the one to two million gas range, whereas right now it's at eight. So it needs probably a four to eight times reduction in gas limit, I would say. Now, to... okay, now the first, can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. So so if the gas limit, let's say that was an issue for somebody, then that would, that would create more blocks no, I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to think what we'll create smaller blocks, smaller blocks. Yes. But it wouldn't necessarily decrease the amount of activity going on, on a chain. Um, there, um, it would naturally decrease the total amount of transactions you could do every hour or every day. Um, absolutely. Okay. It would, it would slow down the rate at which things get added to the blockchain. Yeah, but also quite a lot of it is used highly irresponsibly anyway. So okay, I see. I don't know. There's some, right. even on Ethereum right now, there seem to be a substantial amount of transactions that don't seem to have any economic activity and don't seem to be correlated to any any DApps. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's that. Of course, is a trade off of right. If if that's Another issue that can cause that, right, is the fees being too small. If it's too cheap to run things, right, that's like the semi-spam. People just do all kinds of, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, why EOS right now is uh, publishing millions of transactions a day because they have no block fee, no transaction fees at all. Okay. And um, that type of thing isn't very scalable and really just destroys decentralization in a very key and important way. Interesting. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we've, we've covered all the, all the things, the main, the main things that uh, you wanted to say for today. And so I, <clears throat> I want, as always, thank you for. Oh, wait, wait, oh, I have one more thing. I have okay. One more thing. Um, Mastering Ethereum is now out. Um, okay. It's on Amazon and probably elsewhere. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not exactly sure where it's published, but it's by Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood. Um, Andreas is obviously a personal hero of mine. Yep. And it's it's a really great uh, compendium on Ethereum in general, Ethereum the tech. And there is a chapter in ETC in there uh, in the appendix about the DAO fork and uh, about some other general things as well uh, in a couple other chapters. So I definitely recommend that people check it out if they wanted to, if they want to learn more about Ethereum. Uh, it's definitely a good book to buy. Okay, wonderful. So yeah. Mastering Ethereum is out, okay? With, the, with mention of ETC. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And soon enough, hopefully the second edition will get far more ETC chapters in there. Yeah, <laughs> As we grow and pick up momentum. That's right. Um, and now I can sort of claim that I'm published, kind of a little, not really. Oh, you contributed. <laughs> you contributed part to the ETC sections or something. Yeah, most of that I I wrote. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So yeah, um, you, if I don't see you before the holidays, Christmas, happy, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. Same to all the listeners. Hope you have a great break. And, uh, and uh, yes, so, so best wishes until next time. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Same to you. Have a great day. Right, have, happy holidays. You too. Bye.